So uh, what we're going to do uh, in this session is to place today's scientific and ethics discussion into a clinical context. And uh, we have chosen to discuss a hypothetical case of a family in which breast cancer has been identified. And uh, I've asked Kim Ranieri, who's on my right, uh, genetic counselor at CINJ, to present the case. Kim? Okay. So good morning. Oh, sorry, good morning. Want to start off today by presenting a typical patient that we see in our life center at the Cancer Institute of New Jersey. Um, Karen Smith is a 34 year old woman who presented at the age of 33 with a triple negative left sided breast cancer, triple negative referring to estrogen receptor negative, progesterone receptor negative, and HER2 new negative breast cancer at the age of 33. She was treated with a lumpectomy, radiation therapy, and chemotherapy. After her initial diagnosis, she starts to think about the implications of her cancer diagnosis on other people in the family. Specifically, a patient might have two younger sisters that she's also concerned about their risk now to develop breast cancer in the future. This particular patient also happens to have a six-year-old daughter, and she's concerned about her daughter's risks to develop cancer in the future. So oftentimes a patient like this will present um, through their medical oncologist who refers them for genetic counseling and risk assessment. So this is the pedigree that we might take for a patient who is referred for genetic counseling. I know it's a little bit difficult to see. Karen is right here. She's the proband. She's currently 34 years old and was diagnosed with her breast cancer at the age of 33. You can see she has two children, a six-year-old daughter and her four-year-old son. She has two younger sisters, Sue, who is currently 29 years old and recently got married. Um, Sue has a personal history of infertility. And then the younger sister, Debbie, who is currently 24 years old, um, is in her first year of medical school and uh, is currently single. So this is Karen, her immediate family. She has a mother and a father. Um, father's unaffected with cancer at the age of 68 up here. Mom has actually also had breast cancer. Mom is currently 64 years old and was diagnosed with her breast cancer at the age of 60. Mom was also treated with a lumpectomy and radiation therapy and actually has been taking tamoxifen. There is no other family history of cancer on mom's side of the family. Mom has one brother and a sister who passed away from heart disease. And all of Karen's maternal cousins are unaffected with cancer. Karen's maternal grandparents also passed away up here from non-cancer related causes. Karen's father is healthy at the age of 68. He had a sister who was diagnosed with breast cancer at the age of 40 and passed away at the age of 42 from metastatic disease. And he had a brother who was diagnosed with prostate cancer at the age of 62 and is currently 69. Interestingly, this brother has a daughter who was diagnosed with invasive breast cancer at the age of 38 and is currently 42 years old. That's this woman over here and Karen's right here. In terms of the paternal grandparents, uh, Karen's paternal grandfather passed away from an MI at the age of 80. Her, her paternal grandmother passed away from TB at the age of 32. So this is a typical family history that we might collect during a genetic counseling session. And you can see that there are a lot of people when we're talking about genetics that could be um, impacted by genetic information in this particular family. So after going through with Karen the risks, benefits, and limitations of genetic testing, and that's certainly something we stress is useful to do prior to actually genetic testing for someone, we talk about two genes that are most commonly seen with hereditary early onset breast cancer, and that's BRCA1 and BRCA2. And after talking about this type of testing, issues like insurance discrimination and implications of test results not only for the patient but also for other family members, Karen elected to have genetic testing for BRCA1 and BRCA2. And you can see right here, Karen was identified as carrying a mutation in the BRCA1 gene. Now, once we identify mutation in a family, obviously that has implications for the patient in terms of her future cancer risks, and we'll talk about that. But this also had implications for other people in the family. 
after having a, a further discussion with both Sue and Debbie, both of these women also chose to pursue genetic, pursue genetic testing. Sue over here, um, the 29-year-old sister, tested positive for the familial BRCA1 mutation. And Debbie over here actually tested negative for the BRCA1 mutation. So to take a step back, we know that just based on Karen's age of diagnosis alone, without any family history, her risk to carry a mutation in BRCA1 or BRCA2 was just about 10%, and that's based on some data that looked at an unselected popula patient population of young breast cancer patients and found that of women who were diagnosed with breast cancer before the age of 40, the risk for them to carry a BRCA1 mutation is um, about 10%. Once we add in this family history using various computer risk models, specifically BRCA Pro, we can see that Karen's risk to carry mutation was about 50%. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about the implications of these genetic test results for Karen and the family. Thank you. Uh, yeah. uh, I'd like to introduce our distinguished panel right now. Uh, uh, Dr. David August, raise your hand please. David is Director of Surgical Oncology at the Cancer Institute of New Jersey. Uh, Susan Sklauer Brooks. Susan is uh, Director of Pediatric Medical Genetics at the Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. Uh, Judy Garber, our visitor from Boston, uh, Associate Professor of Medicine at the Dana Farber Cancer Institute. Uh, Paul Miller. Paul is uh, Henry Jackson Professor of Law at the University of Washington. Uh, Kim, you just heard from. Uh, Timothy Rebeck. Uh, is Professor of Epidemiology at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine, and uh, Deb Topmeyer, uh, Director of our uh, Comprehensive Breast Cancer Program at CINJ. And finally, uh, Kang Pu Zhu, uh, Director of the Laboratory of Pre-Implantation Genetics at Cornell uh, University, Weill Cornell Medical School. Uh, so we have a distinguished panel here, and uh, let's begin by asking Dr. Garber, uh, Dr. Garber, you see these patients all the time. Uh, what would you tell her? Well, I think the questions, maybe we can list the, some of the kinds of issues that might arise for Karen as the proband in this case, the first woman tested, and then her sisters who are in different places in their lives when this information becomes available. And to realize first that we're focusing this discussion on Karen and her family, her immediate family, but of course the information has implications for the paternal lineage since our assumption is that those cousins and aunts with breast cancer are likely to have had the same genetic predisposition given their young ages at diagnosis. And so their part of the family also will need to be informed about this information and make their own decisions about whether or not they're ready to pursue testing and the implications of the information. So I distinguish a little bit Karen from her sister because Karen has had breast cancer and her sister at 29 has not. Karen's had a child, her sister has not. Um, Karen may or may not be finished having children. We don't know exactly what her reproductive status is after her breast cancer. Um, but Karen now has to recognize, as does Sue at least, that they are at increased risk for breast cancer compared to the general population. Breast cancer is a rare disease actually in women, doesn't feel that way, but in women under 35, um, it is not a common diagnosis. But once you have a BRCA1 or 2 mutation and a lifetime breast cancer risk in the range of 50 to 80 percent instead of 12 percent like the rest of the population, uh, the risk by age 40 is still substantial. Karen is still at risk to have breast cancer again, and she has been through the breast cancer treatment modalities that we have to offer today uh, and knows what that's like. And her sister, I'm sure, was part of that experience. Um, and also to recognize, not necessarily from family history, but that there's ovarian cancer risk as well. So what patients come wanting to know is, how much risk is there and what can I do about it? How should I be followed? How should I be treated? How can I be ahead of this risk that I now know I have? Um, and that's for the women themselves. Then, of course, there's the next generation, often the most difficult part of recognizing that they have a mutation. I don't know how much. Uh, what about uh, prevention of uh, breast cancer in the uh, younger uh, sibling? 
Well, I think we should hope that Karen will also be a survivor, so we need to think about prevention a little bit in both groups. <coughs> and I think here that you know, these genes were identified now over 10 years ago, and when this all started, the question was, why would anyone want to know what can you do about it, at least when you can focus on breast and ovarian cancer and not have to think about a longer list of options, although that's coming, um, you can focus on those two diseases. So what would you think you would want to do? Well, there's early detection if you can truly diagnose early enough that even if you have to undergo treatment, you're reasonably assured of an excellent outcome, survival. Um, for those who would like to avoid the experience altogether, what have we got for prevention? Well, early detection is not prevention, it's detection. Prevention, at least those things that have been shown to be effective, certainly work by Dr. Rebick and others, um, are surgical options. So in these cases, you can remove the organs at risk even while they're healthy, uh, after assuring yourself to the best of current technologies that they are. And the data show that prophylactic mastectomies will reduce the risk of breast cancer by over 90%. Not 100%, because you can't actually get every last cell, but more than 90%, making it the most effective option for risk reduction. Prophylactic oophorectomies, removal of the ovaries and fallopian tubes, both tissues at risk, will reduce the risk of ovarian cancer by more than 95%, although BRCA1 carriers have some risk from not the ovaries, which are gone, but related cells that remain in the peritoneum, apparently, and can become malignant look and behave like ovarian cancer. That's the most effective option. The issue of when in your life you would choose to undergo such procedures, uh, especially if you haven't yet used those organs for the original purposes, um, those are difficult since the breast cancer risk begins, but is of course not 80% every day, just 80% as a cumulative risk. Uh, and then, of course, we'd rather have non-surgical methods, so there are some uh, medical technologies, uh, medications that have been shown to reduce risk, although not specifically in these populations. These are relatively small groups in the population, and the sample size necessary for most prevention trials um, has not allowed yet prevention strategies to be tested formally in this group, although we all try. Well, uh, let's talk a little bit more about, so she's 29 years old. She wants to have children. and. Uh, she wants to start a family before uh, thinking about some of these uh, options, and uh, she's now undergoing treatment for infertility. Uh, she's considering in vitro fertilization. Uh, so what are her risks? Uh, what, what about her risks in terms of the hormone treatment associated with this, Dr. Rebeck? Well, I think one of the problems that we have uh, in answering that question for a particular patient is that there is really very little data available right now that addresses that question in BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation carriers. There are some data in the general population, uh, but whether those data are, are, are relevant to the BRCA1 or 2 mutation carrying population isn't entirely clear. So really when we base our recommendations to somebody who's trying to make a decision about reproductive uh, history, we have to base it on, on very little hardcore information and, and base it more on um, other information that might be relevant to the, the individual patients. So, for example, we know uh, from talking to our colleagues, but again, not based on published literature, uh, for example, Malcolm Pike at the University of Southern California has spent a lot of time thinking about this problem, and while we don't have specific data to address the question, has um, put together some hypotheses that IVF and the hormones that might be seen um, uh, by these women are minor, have a minor role in breast cancer risk compared to the long-term ovarian hormones that a woman has exposure to over the course of her lifetime. So, you, you know, if you can start putting together little bits and pieces of information from different scientists, you might be able to start thinking about the, some uh, possible increased risk, but maybe not a huge increased risk. And then I think the other uh, piece of information that one needs to consider is uh, that there are other preventive strategies, even if risk were slightly increased by the use of these hormones. Um, can a woman, uh, over time, uh, take, uh, undergo prophylactic surgeries, undergo uh, treatment by chemopreventive agents, something like that, uh, to reduce her risk or potentially offset any risks um, of the IVF itself. 
But again, I think this is because there aren't any uh, strong data, and that's usually the case for many exposures that we have uh, today uh, in the BRCA1 and 2 setting. There isn't really a lot we can tell women uh, that's, that's strong information to, on which we can base these kinds of recommendations or decisions. Uh, Dr. August, she comes to you about the possibility of surgery, uh, prophylactic surgery. Um, she wants to know when she should have the surgery. Yeah, I think that that's always a uh, tough issue when we, we speak about the pro-brand here, for instance. Somebody's already been diagnosed with, with cancer with a strong family history. Often these women are faced with the immediacy of needing cancer treatment and also then with the the Im imperative or the, or the option to uh, undergo genetic testing, which can take a number of weeks uh, to really uh, get results, and then be posed the question about what to do prophylactically. So there's really a, a complex interaction between the immediate need for treatment, the time necessary to collect the necessary information and do the, the patient and family education, and then to also address the longer-term issues of uh, prophylaxis. Uh, in the course of our practice, we really try to emphasize to, to these women that this is not an emergency, uh, and uh, the treatment of the breast cancer is not an emergency, does not have to happen tomorrow. And furthermore, the prophylactic issues can be deferred often until after um, uh, dealing with the immediate breast cancer. So that oftentimes uh, what we'll uh, discuss with these uh, women is undertaking appropriate treatment for the breast cancer and then in a slightly delayed fashion undergoing testing and then the further education and then screening to make the longer term uh, decisions to divorce those long term decisions from the emotional issues surrounding a new diagnosis of breast cancer. Thank you, David. Um What's the risk of the child being born uh, in terms of uh, cancer risk, uh, Dr. Brooks? Well, the, the child was, has a 50-50 chance of inheriting the mom's BRCA mutation. Um, so in that sense, there's a 50-50 risk, but not everyone who inherits the mutation will have cancer in their lifetime, so that will modify that risk. Um, so what about the ethical um, considerations in the bringing into the world a child with such a high risk for having a breast cancer. Is this selfish on the part of the parents, Dr. Miller? Well, I, I think that there are ethical considerations um, here that the parents have to um, grapple with, but I think that they need to grapple with it in the context. Um, as, uh, as was discussed, there is a higher risk of bringing in a child, you know, of, of having a child um, that has uh, the cancer gene, so to speak, but it's not an entire risk of, of having that, um, of having that cancer. And so to, you know, to what extent does a child who is cancer free until the age of 30, 35 or so, maybe forever, um, does that create a problem, an ethical problem? Um, I think that the parents have to um, consider not just sort of the, the risk of having cancer at some time in adulthood, but also um, the, the, the chances that that child is not going to have, um, is not going to have cancer. And the second thing that I think is, is important to, um, in, in important to consider in terms of thinking about this potential child, this future baby, and knowing its, its cancer risk is how might that impact ch uh, parental child rearing in terms of knowing and identifying this child um, forever as, as having the, the BRCA letters on um, her forehead as she um, grows up. And, and I think that that's, that's one very, very important consideration in thinking about these testings. I, I would just like to add, you know, we, I know we haven't yet spoken about the six-year-old daughter, but it brings up um, a, a very real question for a lot of these young women, which is, how does this information affect my child now? Whether my child is six, my child is 16, or my child is 36 years old, what does this information mean for my children? And when that child is six or 16, 
there are a lot of issues that need to be considered in terms of the implications of this information, not only medically, because um, certainly a lot of the interventions that Dr. Garber mentioned are not necessarily offered to women um, in their teenage years or even maybe in their early 20s, um, but also the psychological implications of having this information for a young person to grow up with this information or for a parent to withhold this information from a child. And I, I certainly think that's a, a conversation that has to be had because generally speaking, we do not typically recommend testing minor children for an adult onset hereditary condition if there's nothing that we would do to change their medical management. I'd also jump in here and just emphasize again the, just the turmoil of emotions here so that people are dealing with really life-changing facts, a diagnosis of cancer, issues about their reproductive capability, and how their offspring might turn out. Uh, surgery alone, making decisions about even non-cancer surgery can often be uh, very difficult for uh, patients. There's the whole set of, uh, of familial issues. How does this relate to my sisters, to my mother, to, and the like? Um, and so that within the context of trying to lay out all these factors for people, there, it, it's done within this background of real emotional turmoil that makes it very difficult for people to sort out what their long-term priorities are in the face of having to make some short-term decisions. So um, let's end this part of this uh, scenario here. She decides to have in vitro fertilization. And uh, she, uh, her, her point is that in the next 20 years, science will have discovered new ways to treat with BRCA associated breast cancer, such that my daughter or son, I guess, <laughs> if I'm lucky enough to have one, will not be in a situation uh, similar to mine. So uh, let's go on to the next scene about the young sister, the younger sister, Debbie. Now she's BRCA1 negative. She's 24 years old and a medical student. She's doing a rotation in the lab of Dr. Jean. I was going to say Dr. Jean Levine, <laughs> and who has identified a single nucleotide polymorphism related to HER2 nu, which may lead to an increased risk of young onset aggressive breast cancer. So, given her family history, uh, Debbie agrees to participate in a clinical trial looking at the risk of early onset breast cancer in relation to the SNP that Dr. Jean is uh, conducting. However, in the informed consent that, consent that she signs, it's stated that she will not be provided the results of her test. So let's fast forward four years. Debbie's sister Sue has developed breast cancer at age 33. And papers have been published demonstrating a significant increased risk of early onset breast cancer in women with this SNP. Debbie wants her test results. She wants to know. Dr. Rebeck, if it were your study, do you give her the results? Well, I think that depends a little bit about what the SNP is telling us. Um, we know already that from a lot of research that there are probably no genes left out there, or at least not common ones, that look like BRCA1 or BRCA2. That is, that they confer a very, very high degree of risk, the 50 to 80 percent kind of risk that you've heard about. Um, so while the, we can't rule out the fact that those don't exist, some very smart people have looked very hard for them and they don't find them. Um, so probably what we're talking about with this SNP is a, a variant in the genome that causes a slight a degree of increased risk. Let's say a 50 percent or a 20 percent or even a 10 percent um, increase in risk. So those are two very different sort of scenarios, and I would say that depending on, and it's a continuum, so this would be a judgment call depending on where in the continuum the result lies, and secondly, how convinced we are that that risk is real, because many risks that are reported in the literature are not validated or, or replicated, and we can't really be sure that they're real increases in risk. But let's just suppose that we truly believe it's an increased risk. I would say if, it's, if it were my study, uh, and it looked like a BRCA1 kind of situation with a huge amount of risk. 
I would consider giving the, res the results back to the, the woman. Um, under very careful consideration with the IRB that originally approved the study. Uh, this is what was done in the early studies of BRCA1 and 2 when people participated in family-based studies to locate these genes. And it was very clear at one point who carried these genes in the family, even though they were sort of told, we're not, we're not going to tell you uh, what happens. It became very clear that there were clinical implications for these women that needed to be uh, brought out and that it was unethical not to tell the women uh, about this incredibly high degree of risk. So if that were the situation, I think that one would have to confer with the IRB and, and work with the, um, the patients to try to get this information out. If it was a 10% increased risk or a, you know, a very minor uh, increase in risk, I think it would be a very different situation that you'd have to think about. Um, would this knowledge of this gene actually really affect clinical management or care uh, prevention? Would you do something about a 10% increase in risk? Would you have your ovaries removed? Would you start taking tamoxifen, et cetera? Um, and I think that the, the point about genetic testing is that it's, it can be quite valuable if there's something you can do with the genetic information. And if there isn't anything you can do or if you're not sure what to do with the genetic information, then you have to be careful about it. And so if a situation arose where it was a very small increase in risk, I would have to think twice about whether this information would be given back. And in fact, for most of the studies that we do, which deal with very small increases in risk, we don't give our results back and we don't plan to. Uh, Dr. Miller, then Dr. Garber, did he make the right decision here, telling her? I, I think I think so. Um, uh, being a Penn grad myself, I oh, would have to agree. <laughs> um, I, I think that uh, I, I think that it depends. The question here is, it depends on sort of its clinical relevancy, and and I think the underlying question here is is more information, or is all information always a good thing? And and. In today's world, uh, with the internets and the tubes and, the, and all the other stuff, everybody <laughs> is constantly trying to get more and more information. And I would probably presume that patients want lots and lots of information when fa faced with, with a crisis. But information, I think, particularly powerful information, is only good if you can do something with it, if it's clinically relevant, and if a patient receives that information within the, the proper context in terms of describing what this information means, how they should use the information, and that would, with that would presuppose um, genetic counseling and so on. But because the impact of this information um, uh, is very strong, and, and you want to be careful, not that you're hiding something from a patient, but that you're contextualizing information in a way that people can understand the information and, in a sense, move on with their lives. Dr. Garber? So, as the clinician in the group for the moment, the only things I would remind us all is, first, one of the things that we're hearing is the woman who's very anxious about breast cancer She's a medical student, so she's, we assume, quite sophisticated in her understanding of these issues, but may have heard on the news that, you know, these genes give an increased risk for breast cancer and may have really, at this moment, very little understanding of the magnitude of the difference that we're talking about. So it is about context. And you can imagine that explaining all of these conditional probabilities to a medically sophisticated or mathematically sophisticated audience is one thing, but for regular people who, in our culture, really don't understand probability very well at all, this is an enormous challenge and they have to then, as David said, in the middle of an emotional time, try to understand all of these what ifs and if thens that we present to them. The other thing is, in talking about the benefits of information, sometimes the only benefit is relief of uncertainty. And not always do we do that very well. We replace uncertainties with varying levels of uncertainty. We don't make them go away. That's often I mean, sometimes the patients who have the hardest time are the ones whose families test negative. They have a family history that they're concerned about. We can't even tell them where it came from. But these SNPs, which are clearly going to have a great impact overall, for individual information are not always so powerful. So part of the other piece Tim has to struggle with running his lab is that there are laws that say that that information from tests that are used for clinical decisions have to come from laboratories that have taken certain 
actions to make sure that, for example, the specimen whose results you're giving actually goes with the person who gave the specimen. I mean, that you didn't have a sample mix-up in the lab. In a research lab, you can tolerate a certain amount of inaccuracy. In a clinical lab, you can't. So one not uncommon strategy for dealing with something like this would be to say to uh, this woman, you know, I'd love to share this information with you, but in fact, I can't be certain enough that it's yours. You need to have another blood sample drawn and a test analyzed. That's easy if it's clinically available. If it's a relatively obscure research test done only in certain research labs, you, you really then, that, then you have to go through this whole exercise. But, and for obvious reasons, and you, you, you hate to have someone call on the phone and say, I want the results of my sample, you analyzed it, I want it, and they have no counseling, no context, no place to put this, and your IRB is likely to say, well, you know, now there's clinical implications for this. It may be that you should give that information, but you, the scientist, are the one who's supposed to explain all this uh, on the phone. That, that may or may not work out very well. David, do you have a comment? So what if the patient comes to you Judy and says, you're my doctor, and I've heard about this SNP and the like, and I'm very uncomfortable with the fact that this Dr. Rebick is saying he thinks 25% is a relevant risk, but that 13% is not. This is my life, not his, and I'm a medical student. I understand these things pretty well. So I want to speak with Dr. Rebick. You know who he is. Make an introduction for me. Uh, you know, how would I get you those feel emails about, all the time, by the way. Right. <laughs> well, it's no problem for me. I just call Tim and say, here. <laughs> so how would you feel about call that, Tim? Tim? I mean, well, well you, know, you know, there's even a, a broader issue here. Do we inform everyone right. who is positive now? Right. right. I mean, we... I, we screen everyone. It's, it's fairly easy when you get a random email from whatever source to say, I'm sorry, we don't give results back. And for me, that's, general, that's the answer for all of these kinds of studies until we really have um, hard and fast clinical implications to a, a variant. And, and for, for the most part, those just don't exist. So it's been easy so far. It won't be easy forever once these start becoming more clinically real. So would you refuse to speak with them? The so patient? no, I, well, I, I answer politely back that we you know, can't. <laughs> I, and it doesn't happen that often, of course. So, but I think that we will have to have um, protocols in place. Think we have thought about protocols for when some of these do come back as real. And my colleague at Penn who studies apolipoprotein E for cardiovascular disease risk and now has to deal with all the Alzheimer's risk uh, problems that have ero arisen out of that, which was none of his doing, but has sort of come along on the side, has taught us a lot about the collateral information and scientific research that's arising that we may have to deal with someday soon. We just haven't had to yet, so it <laughs> we have theoreticals about what we might do, but we haven't had to do it yet, so. Okay, well, let's put the question. To tell or not to tell? How many would tell the, the medical student about the test? Do we get a depends? <laughs> <laughs> Raise your hand. That's for the lawyer. To Only say. if. <laughs> how about the audience? The uh, how many would tell the medical student about the test? Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. All right. Well, um, let's go on here. Uh, let's go back to let's go to Debbie now. She's 34 years old. Uh, uh, go back to Debbie. That is. Uh, She's a successful medical oncologist. Um, uh, she now marries a wealthy venture capitalist. <laughs> because she wants to stay in academics. <laughs> uh, she's found out, someone has squealed, that she has, she's a carrier of the high-risk uh, single uh, nucleotide polymorphism. She, has a, she wants a family, she's concerned about the prospect of passing on the SNP and now that there are data from numerous studies demonstrating a link between the SNP and an increased incidence of early onset breast cancer. She just read a study in Nature Genetics uh, about studies done at New Jersey Stem Cell Institute where investigators have been able to repair SNPs in embryonic stem cells in preclinical models. She remembers having met Dr. Zhu at the time her sister was considering uh, PGD. Anybody know what that is? Pre-implantation genetic okay. diagnosis. All right. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Zhu now routinely uses PGD to select normal embryos for high-risk patients. 
She consults with Dr. Zhu, but does not want embryos killed. That's her choice of words, if they are found to be SNP positive. Debbie asked Dr. Zhu, given the exciting new studies at the New Jersey Stem Cell Institute, why can't you use their technology to repair my SNP positive embryos rather than kill them? I'm willing to pay, her husband's willing to pay, that is, whatever it costs. We're willing to pay. But Dr. Zhu, maybe you can explain to me about PGD first. And why didn't my sister select this? Was this offered to her, and what were the risks and benefits? Uh, the PGD um, is a pre-implantation genetic diagnosis that we identify genes, whether it's a mutation at single cell level, that we remove single cell from the embryo. So we select that uh, uh, unaffected, non-affected embryos to put it back. Uh, but for this hypothetical scenario, I think, uh, obviously, it, it's not that far yet. Uh, although, you know, we are doing lots of uh, PGD for various diseases and for early onset or late onset. But um, to correct that, uh, I think that's far, far away from uh, what uh, the reality. Um, you know, technically, from animal model, you can correct the genes and then you can put it back. And, it could be a form of chimeric embryo, and it, it may survive, but um, it is not the reality at this moment. Uh, but we obviously need funding and support. That I think from long term, it is an important area of research. Other comments? What, what do we know about the risks of the PGD? You're taking a fairly early embryo with, with only a few cells in it and removing one of those cells. Uh, do we know about the long-term risks to fetal development and, and subsequent child development from removing that cell? The short-term uh, risk, let, let's say just the immediate risk of by removing one or two cells uh, from a healthy embryo seem to be minimal. Uh, we have a, you know, thousands, of, worldwide, thousands of a PGD baby born, and so far there is no uh, noticeable uh, major uh, addition or increase of a risk, uh, but a long term obviously not known. There is so uh, it's a complex system from a stimulation. The embryo exposed in, in vitro for uh, three five days, and there's uh, uh, recent discoveries that epigenetic may play effect a particular culture, media environment, the temperature. It's I think in incubator is not as good as a, definitely not as a, good as a. A human, so uh, we still know that it, there is something there. Uh, so long-term effect is not very clear. I think we need uh, a really careful study. And, and can you comment, or anyone on the panel comment, how often women and their spouses or significant others choose this process when they have hereditary cancer syndromes like HNPCC or breast ovarian cancer syndromes? It's getting along, and I think uh, we uh, use this PGD for all different kinds of diseases, and the cancer risk is one of the increasingly uh, noticed because the public are more aware of it, and oncologists are more aware of that. Uh, so uh, it's, it, the number is increasing, but it's still uh, on case basis. I think the numbers are still small, and in England, I guess, where they surveyed some women who are at hereditary risk for cancers of this type about PGD, um, women wanted the availability of PGD as, as, a, as an option, and these were women who, who had history of breast cancer, and, but of those women who, in fact, were c considering a pregnancy, a far smaller group of women would actually consider having the PGD. Judy? And what about the ethical considerations of, of a disease you can understand for Huntington's disease, but for later onset like breast ovarian cancer syndromes or HNPCC, does it have the same ethical implications? Should we be doing this in, in hereditary cancer syndromes? Maybe ask yes, Dr. Miller to answer well, that question. Well, I think, uh, I, I think it's, very, it's very complicated, and there are um, sort of a myriad of issues involved here. One is, um, first to recognize that this is very, very expensive stuff. 
And so to the extent that you are, so, so, so the fact that th this woman's husband or the, f the father of this child is a venture capitalist is very relevant. Um, <laughs> and, and so, um, uh, uh, so, so I think that's w one sort of aspect, sort of as a societal matter. How are we going to think about these new technologies in terms and the, and potentially um, important health technologies in terms of access? Who has access to to those issues? Let me. Uh, secondly, I would say that it 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 has the potential for changing the relationship between the parent and that child in very significant ways. And I would argue, regardless of which way the test turns out. So, so here's a woman who's having trouble conceiving, problems conceiving, and she has, and the, 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 the embryo has this risk, an increased risk of getting an un, adult onset cancer. Do you terminate that pregnancy with the expectation that you may not again get pregnant? Or do ultimately you say, well, we've got a, a, an embryo here, let's go forward and then have the child knowing that this child in fact has, has that risk? And secondly, I would sort of add another hypothetical. Um, since this technology is sort of advancing fairly rapidly, and I'd be interested in how the doctors, uh, the clinicians maybe, might sort of think of this. Let's say there's an already a child, um, an older sibling. Now there's a PGD potential where you can test sort of sibling uh, child number two. So parents don't know about child number one, but do know that child number two, they go through with the pregnancy, is not at risk. Is that something that we sort of, we want to sort of have parents walking around with? Is that sort of a, a type of procedure that we really want parents to be thinking about when you're really talking about a disease that may not occur until they're 35 years old? I just want to If I can just react to the, the language there a little bit. Sure. And, and to say it provocatively, I mean, who are we to decide? Uh, I mean, this is sophisticated, pay. this lady is capable, she's fertile, she's rich, uh, she's smart, and why shouldn't this be her choice? Okay, Judy, well, uh, we have two, two last words. Go ahead, Dr. I just want to clarify, um, the, one, the comment is that uh, PGD differs from prenatal diagnosis, and in PGD, you're dealing with an embryo that is not yet a pregnancy as opposed to prenatal diagnosis where it would be a, a termination of a pregnancy if you so decided not to have a, that child. And that, so the advantage of PGD is the, is the ability to diagnose before you actually have a, a pregnancy um, in the embryo. And that is a difference for these later onset diseases, certainly. So what's the success rate, uh, Dr. Zhu? With oh, uh, very much it depends on the age of the uh, Women and uh, as uh, age go goes up and uh, the success rate is is down. I think uh, um, let's say cut off a point of a thirty something, thirty four, uh, early thirties, the success rate will be between twenty five percent to forty uh, to forty five percent okay. for over one attempt. Okay. Well, we're going to have to end this great uh, session, but. Uh, Deb and then Judy will let you have the last words. Yeah, I was just going to raise the issue, and Judy, maybe we spoke about this a little bit. Do you think that counseling these patients that we are, quote, ethically obligated to offer them PGD? So we, do, we talk about PGD, but as Dr. Miller pointed out, um, PGD is very expensive. The genetic analysis is cheap. Right? You know the mutation, you can look for that. It costs a few hundred dollars, and insurance will cover that but that's all they'll cover. They won't cover the $30,000 or so necessary to otherwise have the procedure. And I think we have to be careful, too, about giving our patients, to some extent, the illusion of control. Everybody wants control. This is all about control. She's got risk all over the place, but any parent will tell you that you don't have total control from the moment this all starts. <laughs> and I, don't, I completely believe that you, you, know, you may control this, but you don't control everything else. And 
I, I'm not sure what will happen to these relationships when people, in, with all best intentions, try very hard to protect their children as everyone does. Um, Okay, well, thank all the panelists. I think uh, it was a very interesting and informative discussion. We thank you all. I think it sets the stage now for uh, the, the uh, sessions that will follow. Uh